thank you so much for choosing to be here at the York Festival of Ideas on a relatively sunny Sunday morning-ish. Um, thank you very much. My name is Junkin Cannon. I'm director of the York Festival of Ideas. Um, today is second of our in-person days after two years of um, interesting challenges. Um, before I hand over to our fantastic um, panel, I just wanted to say a word about what else is happening today. If any of you have got children anywhere in the environment, the Guildhall is stuffed full of interesting things that you can take them to. Otherwise, um, the rest of the day is really framed around time and consequence. We've got Tracy Borman tracing the entire history of Britain from 1066 to now. Uh, we've got the Oscar-winning uh, film editor of June, uh, 12 Years a Slave, and goodness knows what else, uh, around the corner at York Theatre Royal at 2 o'clock. We've got a fantastic, really fascinating talk on mudlarking. No, I didn't know what it was either. Scavenging um, on the Thames uh, as well. And then we end today with the fantastic return of Tim Dowling, who is um, a regular at the Festival of Ideas. So if you haven't got tickets for any of that, there are still some available. And uh, enjoy the rest of the day. But I'm now going to hand over to somebody who is clearly not my colleague, Emma Tomini, who has... Um, COVID, but sign of the times. I'm going to hand over to the fabulous Jack Britton from our economics department who's in charge and will introduce our great panel. I will say it's an absolute pleasure to be working with the Resolution Foundation. We're a huge admirer of their work. We've been trying to get Torsten to come for many years and we finally landed him. So thank you very much. Jack. Um, hello everyone. Uh, very nice to see you all here in person. Um, and yeah, welcome to the York Festival of Ideas. So I'm Jack Britton, I'm from the Institute for Fiscal Studies and the University of York, uh, and I'm gonna be chairing today's event. Um, before I introduce you to the panelists, I just want to draw attention to the uh, exits um, in case of emergency. I'm sure you've all read the thing that was up there in close detail while you were sitting waiting, um, so I probably don't need to say any more, but um, yeah, please just be aware of those. Uh, and I would also ask everyone to put their phones on silent, please, um, so that we're not interrupted. Um, okay, so thank you for joining us for this panel discussion, which is presented in collaboration with the Resolution Foundation. Uh, Resolution Foundation is an independent think tank focused on improving living standards for those on low to middle incomes. Today we're going to explore the UK economy as it faces a decisive de decade of huge economic change from restructuring after Brexit and the pandemic to urgently transitioning to a net zero future and adapting to technological shifts amid an aging population. In this session, we're gonna be asking how will economic change affect the jobs we do, the places we live, and the firms we work for? What can we learn from past periods of change and how we can build a new economic strategy that responds to the challenges of the 2020s as well as our legacy problems of weak productivity, high inequality, and stagnating living standards. To explore these questions, I am delighted to introduce our expert panel, who will each give a short presentation on their own view on these questions before coming together for a panel discussion, during which we will delve deeper into the discussion, inviting you, the audience, to uh, ask questions throughout. Uh, there will be roving mics. Um, uh, when that, that, that opportunity comes up, please do wait until the mic's in your hand to, to speak, otherwise it kind of screws up the, uh, the sound for, for people listening uh, online. Um, so let me uh, introduce the panel members. So first we've got uh, Torsten Bell. He is the chief executive of the Resolution Foundation, uh, has a background in economic policy and his current research focusing on inequality, the labor market, tax and benefits, and housing and wealth. Prior to leading the Resolution Foundation, Torsten was Director of Policy at the Labour Party. Uh, he has also worked in the Treasury and as a member of the Council for Economic Advisers during the financial crisis and as a civil servant. Uh, Kirsten England is Chief Executive of the City of Bradford Metropolitan District Council. Her key challenges are to ensure growth in the Bradford economy is sustainable and that there is significant uplift in levels of education attainment within the district. Prior to taking up her post in Bradford, Kirsten was chief executive of York for six years, and Kirsten's career has included work in the voluntary sector, higher education, central government, as well as 21 years in local government. She's extremely passionate about community capacity building, diversity and equality, supporting civic engagement, and sustainable urban growth. And finally, uh, Chris Giles, uh, who is the 
who became editor of the Financial Times in 2004. Uh, having previously served as lead writer, he, his reporting covers um, global and economic Affairs, global and UK economic affairs, and he writes a UK economic co column fortnightly. Before joining the Financial Times as economics editor, he was economics reporter for the BBC, worked for Ofcom, the telecommunications regulator, and started his career with seven years as an economist at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Chris loves numbers, he wanted to tell you. Um, so first I'm going to hand over to Torsten. Well, it's good to be back in York, see lots of friendly faces. It's good the mic is now working uh, as well. There, and thanks, Jack, for the introduction. Jack's very kindly stepped in and also shown that when there's a next, there's an easy jet problem. He's the man to show you the exits uh, from the planes and keep the planes uh, running. Um, right, I, I'm going to slightly... Um, oh, there's a slight danger we're all going to agree a bit. <laughs> so I'm going to try to stop that happening uh, as much as um, possible. The, um, uh, so I'm going to start a bit with the problem and then spend most of the time on the controversial stuff, which is would we like actually to have an answer, okay? The, um, uh, and the easy way to think about the problem facing Britain as it meanders through the 21st century is that we're combining um, the stagnation of the 2010s, of the last decade that we've all lived through. That's what you'll be used to seeing on the BBC News when they have their depressing charts going downwards telling us that we haven't managed to get any wage growth since before the financial crisis in terms of where we were. We went into the pandemic with wages at exactly the same level they were as we entered the financial crisis. That's not normal, by the way. I know it's kind of, we've started thinking it's normal because, you know, it's like Stockholm syndrome. Uh, but that is not normal. That hasn't happened in other decades before. The, um, the same is true on incomes, even if it's slightly less depressing because employment did actually grow in the last decade, but income still grew at, grew at half the level in the 2010s that we were used to in previous decades. So having your head, 2010 stagnation. The reason it's so bad, though, is that 2010 stagnation is running into the 1980s inequality that we've been living with ever since. And that's the, it's the 1980s that sees inequality shoot up. The, um, and then it doesn't, despite what people say when they need to sell books, it's always permanently increasing and all the rest. It hasn't been permanently increasing. It's just stayed really high ever since. And we have amongst the highest inequality in Europe, slightly lower than the United States. So those two things together are what I hold in your head. Now, the bad end of themselves, but they combine if you add them together. So, you know, if you are, have high inequality and low growth, that's really bad if you're poor. So to be poor in Britain today, you are 20% poorer than somebody poor in France, even though our countries are basically the same in terms of how well off they are. It's not 2%, it's not 3%, it's 20% different, okay? That is why when a crisis hits like the one we're going through now, you get destitution happening fast. People haven't margins to soak up bad stuff happening. That is not what a resilient society looks like. Second, in terms of how they combine, think about this. Public worries about inequality did not go up when inequality went up, right, in the 1980s at all, really. They went up when everyone's income started stagnating. Basically, people put up with things getting unequal in the 80s because some people were getting quite well off unless you lived in one of the areas that saw surging unemployment. Yeah, 30% income growth in the 1980s versus nine in the last decade. But this decade has got, let, got that inequality, but nobody's getting better off. And that's when you saw concerns about inequality going up. So these are not separate things. They're felt as a deep squeeze that's worse for the poor but exists there for uh, every, uh, everybody. Now, some people say, well, look, everyone bad decade globally after the financial crisis amongst advanced economies, and that is true. Uh, but that doesn't mean we should just shrug our shoulders and say, yeah, it's all fine, because we are the winners in having the worst time. The, uh, our productivity slowdown is worse than any comparable economies. The, um, the second thing people say to me sometimes that will make this all okay is that it will just, you know, well, look, you go through phases, there's bad phases, and then things turn around. Did you notice the 70s? Sometimes people say. They are, and to which I always say to them, Italy. Countries don't automatically turn around when things start going wrong. In the 1980s, people were writing uh, newspaper articles about how Italy was the new frontier economy. It was going to be their manufacturing firms were so much better than uh, American firms. They were going to take over the world. What are we going to do? They've got Parmesan, and now they're going to get our money as well, right? I'm not joking. There's a whole literature that went on for a decade about it, right? Italy was as rich as Germany then, and now it's only the same as Spain. It's fallen hugely behind. It's actually got poorer over those years, and that's because toxic economic failure has combined with political disaster, which is what happens when you start getting in these cycles and has not been able to 
from it. So don't assume it will happen. Right. Then, will it get addressed? Is it getting addressed? Why won't it get addressed, this problem we've got, the stagnation that Britain's living through? Now, the first thing to say is addressing it is hard. Okay, this isn't easy for any government, even if you had a really, really bad government, you may or may not think we uh, do. The, um, uh, and we don't control all of it. You know, Britain doesn't, we live in a global economy, we don't control everything that matters for our economic success. But we're not even remotely serious about trying. Okay. And if I'm honest, it's not just the politicians aren't serious, the debate generally isn't serious. We're in denial about what the nature of our economy is. If one more politician tells me that the way Britain's going to be rich is as a manufacturing superpower, uh, when I show the chart showing that nobody works in manufacturing, it hasn't since 1990, uh, <coughs> in cuckoo land, uh, half the world wants to pretend that Brexit has no effect on our, whatever you think about Brexit, pros and cons, more sovereignty and all the rest, it's definitely made us poorer. We're in denial uh, about that. On the other side of the ledger, the left in Britain wants to pretend that if you just have a bit of green growth, you know, and solve climate change, which we do need to do to solve the planet, I hasten to add, that that will solve all our economic problems. I'm afraid that it's a cloud cuckoo land. We're not going to be not going to providing enough jobs remotely plausibly. It's not going to be growing the economy significantly. It's just going to change the nature of that economy over the fall. So we're not serious about it. Other evidence of seriousness? People always say to me, oh, well, the real problem is that our economy is just changing too fast these days. That's the problem. Uh, okay. On almost every metric, our economy is changing less than it used to, and that is not always a good thing, right? People are moving jobs less, which is how people get decent pay rises. People from poorer areas are not moving around the country, again, despite what Norman Tebbit wanted or what um, some people think is happening. And particularly for young people, this is really limiting some of their opportunities. Right, then briefly, what does plausible success look like? Because like relationships, life is about, and economics is about what could plausibly happen, and how do you make it happen? It's not what did you have a dream about wishing was going to happen, okay? Which is what, you know, and that's the same with our, our, our partners. The, um, uh, right, now, uh, the nature of the economy. We are a service superpower. Britain's the second biggest exporter of services in the world. That is not going to change. We are not suddenly going to go back to being what we were in the 1970s and the 60s. Even then, we were relatively heavy on services. But we are going to be doing services, if we're, unless we're poor, right? So the question is, how do we do that well? Okay. And how do we do that in a way that doesn't lead to increases in inequality? Because all else equal, a service economy is a more unequal economy, both between rich and poor workers, but also between rich and poor places. Service output is more concentrated in big cities, Goods, goods production can be more spread out across poorer areas. Hull might benefit from some goods production, but Leeds will benefit from high-value services. So we are going to be services. Denying that's not going to get us anywhere, but then you need to be really honest about the problems that it brings uh, with it. Then what does that mean for how you close regional gaps, the levelling up discussion that we all uh, talk about it? Well, it means that we, we, are, we haven't got much choice about being a service economy, but we don't have to be as London focus on economy. Uh, here we have other cities. Those people could be exporting uh, services around the world, drawing on Britain's strengths in those areas, but they're not. Whenever I do stuff in Birmingham, which I do quite a lot, or in Leeds this week, there's, there's a lot of mixed emotions about saying you even want that, okay? But unless that is what happens, those places are going to stay much poorer than the southeast of England. There is no other plausible route to their success. They're, then we need to make sure that the wider regions around them are connected to those places, okay? <laughs> So Bradford would be a big winner from Leeds sorting itself out and having, and, and people in Leeds think it is very successful, but the data, I'm afraid, shows it's not nearly as successful as some people uh, say, including people in Wakefield, when they're moaning about Leeds being uh, too um, successful. Have, so we need to focus on that. But then with the trade-off, because I said we need to be clear about what's difficult, if Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham became successful like that, that would help the economy overall being more equal, regionally equal, but it would probably increase inequality within Yorkshire, right? It would help poor people in London, whose housing costs would fall, relatively, but it would push up housing costs for poor people in Leeds, right? So you, need, you really need a strategy rather than individual fingers because you've then got to deal with those problems as they emerge. Right, then, lastly, before I wrap up, you, you need to be much more radical about saying... You, if you, like everybody in British politics now says they want a fairer economy. Okay? And then they have a tiny tweak here that will suddenly make everything go away. Benefit systems a little bit more generous on this side of things, uh, or I'm going to move some civil servants up to Darlington because I'm too stupid to put them in Leeds where they belong. The, um, uh, now, look, the lessons of the last 10 years is that we have much more choice about the nature and the quality of low-wage jobs 
than our textbooks sometimes told us they were. The national living wage, huge increase in the minimum wage policy. We've gone from you know, no minimum wage in the 90s to now having amongst the advanced of the biggest in the advanced world. We're even going to overtake the French at some point, probably. It's going to cause a lot of upset in France when that happens. They, um, and we've done that without any costs to employment. Right? We need to take that lesson, which is when jobs aren't being traded around the world, you've got more choice about the nature of those jobs. There is no reason why low, low earners don't have guaranteed certainty of when their shifts take place. There's no reason why there's no enforcement, basically. It's basically no enforcement of our labor market regulations, except for on the minimum wage. There's no reason uh, for that. There's no reason why we, don't, um, why we have a tax system that encourages companies to force low earners into self-employment without employment rights. These things can all be done. There are trade-offs. Some of them would push up prices for the rest of us. But countries that have higher wages and higher prices for their non-tradable sectors, haircuts, right, are fairer countries. They're not necessarily slower growing, but they have lower inequality in general. And getting serious then also means accepting that the state is going to get bigger in the 2020s. We're getting older. It's not just York, although York is getting older, by the way. The, um, uh, but the country is getting older. We will have a bigger state to help pay for that. All right. And being an adult means recognising that means higher taxes, but it also means that you can't keep asking young workers to pay all those taxes. Some people whose houses have got more expensive, I'm afraid, need to cough up. Otherwise, you're going to be crucifying the same people whose wages are not growing over and over again. And then lastly, you can't keep separating the incomes of poorer households ever more from the rest of the population. If you look at what we've been doing since the 80s, it's to residualise the welfare state for those on disabilities and those who fall out of work, in, less if they have children, but for those other groups more and more, which is why the bottom of our population is now so much poorer than the equ uh, than equivalents in other countries. And in the end, that isn't what a decent society looks like, and that will mean spending money when it comes to benefits and with tax rises for the rest of us to pay for it. So it is hard facing up to the stagnation we're in. We're not currently doing it in British politics today, but it is possible, and I promise you don't want to be Italy, because at some point, Berlusconi turns up. <laughs> and on that note, yeah. if, if, he, if he hasn't already, um, so um, we, uh, yeah, I'm going to hand over to Kirsten. Thank you very much, and uh, it's great to follow Torsten, who is as provocative as ever. And I'm kind of tempted to um, say, I know you want us to disagree, but I kind of agree and, so it's a yes and kind of statement, really. And I'll just, I suppose I'll just start by saying Leeds and Bradford as an economic entity, its population and GVA is greater than that of Birmingham, and actually the biggest flows of people between any two UK cities on a daily basis are actually between Leeds and Bradford. And, and it's 74% from Bradford to Leeds, but it is 26% coming from Leeds to Bradford. So to, we do think of ourselves as an economic entity that will thrive if we work together. Hence why Channel 4 came to be based there. Guess what, you know, and why Yorkshire Building Society might be um, based in Bradford, but has a kind of executive suite on the headroom in Leeds. So lots and lots of ways in which we're already interdependent and we're not, not seeing ourselves as rivals, and I guess that's that getting that competition collaboration dynamic right. But, I mean, first of all, it's great to be back in York, uh, where I was privileged to be chief executive for six years, did lots of exciting uh, things in, the, in that time, and also fantastic to see the festival ideas flourishing and being able to happen physically again. So all credit to the University of York for sustaining that programme and keeping its ambition. So it is um, absolutely great to be there. But I have been chief executive now in Bradford for seven years. So what I want to do very quickly is a little bit about, um, for many people, just the distinctiveness of Bradford against that UK descriptor that you've just given. Yeah, uh, a little bit about where, where we've been. Absolutely, the 1980s is a defining moment in the, in the history of our city and the um, fortunes of people within it. Uh, a little bit pre-pandemic and now and what we're actually doing. And I'm not trying to solve the problems of the UK economy, but some glancing references to some of what might need to happen nationally, uh, Torsten. So a uh, quick bit of background. For those of you that aren't aware, it's the fifth biggest city in the UK outside of London. So it's kind of Birmingham, Leeds, Sheffield, Glasgow, Bradford is the kind of scale. And Manchester in its core as an as an authority area is actually kind of smaller, as is Liverpool, Bristol, Nottingham, Leicester. So it's a, a hugely significant population base. What is even more important, in a sense, is we're hyper young. So, and not with any kind of criticism implied, um, the contrast between this audience and my population could not be more extreme. So 30% of the residents of Bradford are under the age of 20. One in three of us 
are under the age of 20. 70% 70 of the residents are under the age of 50. Now, in an ageing country with tight labour markets, uh, this is a population that is too significant to overlook. We are also um, hyper-diverse, so uh, 175 languages spoken, 35%, so over a third of the population has a heritage other than in um, the UK. Um, and I like to call us an immigrant city where so many of us, including myself, as you can probably tell I'm from Edinburgh, or from Scotland at least, um, have come to make a better life for ourselves and our families uh, in Bradford. And that gives it a sort of energy, a tenacity, a creativity and a resilience which also needs to be harnessed if we are to achieve the productivity um, that, that you, um, you're speaking of, really. Um, my abiding priority, and it's enshrined in the local government, that is actually inclusive and sustainable prosperity for the people of Bradford. You know, uh, the highest possible level of prosperity, well-being, but not at the expense of the future. Now, in the kind of, um, you know, popular strapline of now, net zero and levelling up, as it is now kind of, you know, spray-painted everywhere, um, particularly into government policy documents, we're all kind of, you know, seeking to demonstrate we are uh, the poster child for levelling up. Um, you actually might say Bradford should be the poster child for levelling up. We're going to be serious about that and the productivity um, of this country. And um, a recent study did actually identify Bradford as number one in the UK in terms of suppressed potential for growth and capacity to contribute, but also for levels of deprivation. So 40%, four in 10 of the children in my uh, district live below the poverty line. I mean, that is shocking in the sixth most affluent country in the world. Just shocking and a source of embarrassment to me. So, um, just a reminder, and it's a reminder of how quickly these things change the arc of history and the fortunes of place. In the early 20th century, uh, I think it was 1904, um, more bottles of champagne were consumed in Bradford than anywhere else in the world. And when there was, and I know this because when there was a landslip in Epernay, where Paul Roger is made, um, the Lord Mayor of Bradford's charity for that year was to support the poor inhabitants of Epernay. And in the 21st century, when they needed to use uh, advanced technology to do the archaeology to discover there were any bottles of champagne left, they came to Bradford University, which has fantastic digital forensic capability in archaeology. And why did they, and they were saying, well, why did you come to us? Well, because of that historic connection between Epine and Bradford. Just, but just to think about, but absolutely, as you say, I mean, textiles and engineering, well, textiles and the associated engineering always subject to boom and bust, um, and absolutely to collapse in the 1980s, the deindustrialization, failing to automate, uh, failing to innovate in terms of materials and failing to take account of the way the global markets were shifting. Um, that compounded, absolutely. I mean, funnily enough, I lived in a council house for four years in the 1980s. I absolutely remember the accelerating levels of inequality. So I sometimes feel I've lived in this different bubble to everybody else, because it was pretty apparent when I was living in Mossad and Manchester and we had riots, um, and people were literally dying in the next door flat because um, they had no access to income and they didn't have a GP. And anyway, you know, I could go on about what we were seeing in terms of destitution at that time. However, I, t I take your point. But the recession of, of um, the noughties, stalled projects, reduced confidence, the geopolitics of the moment after 9-11, um, uh, also crushed the kind of like confident self-esteem and positioning of my city and accelerated um, decline. I would say, you know, so we are living with all of the issues that you, you, you describe. Uh, Pre-pandemic, however, you know, some green shoots of growth, renewed confidence of working sub-regionally, understanding our economy sub-regionally, moving towards collaboration, uh, positioning the ambition of our place, as I've described, as young, digital, globally connected, uh, entrepreneurial, second most entrepreneurial place in the UK. Um, and seeing, and well, and <laughs> I hear what you're saying about manufacturing, 13% of the economy of Bradford is manufacturing, increasingly advanced manufacturing, innovating around uh, materials and health, um, digital as well. But anyway, the, you know, um, I'm, I know I'm probably going on too long, but another very interesting little play. Um, 80% of cars in the world have a part made in the Bradford district. Um, a spring, a clip, a solar panel. Hmm? What parts then? What? A spring, Not a clip. Not the same part. 
No, 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 absolutely not, no. From the kind of, you know, the solar panels on my camper van, as I discovered when I bought a camper van, and they said, oh, um, we get the solar panels from Keithley, you might not know, and I said, well, funnily enough, I live on the moor above Keithley, but anyway. Um, so very significant still, but also our uh, largest food manufacturer in this country, Morrison's, is, is based, and, and still disproportionate representation in the financial services sector, Yorkshire Building Society. So, um, and before the pandemic, we'd seen the most significant increase in weekly wages, highest level of re-entry of women to the marketplace with underemployment of women. Um, and key decisions, Channel 4 coming, the NEC um, coming to build the second largest venue outside London, um, and PwC starting an office where Kevin Ellis, the chair, said they have never seen CVs of the quality they've had from young people in Bradford. They redesigned their business process so 18 to 24 year olds could enter the labour market. It's now up to 300 employees of the most diverse uh, in all dimensions. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I'll go quickly on. Um, pandemic, though, um, you know, ravaged along the lines of inequality. Um, we're a frontline worker economy. We weren't at home. We die disproportionately. People living in um, densely occupied inner city neighbourhoods, multi-generational, um, not able to isolate. And uh, many children in my district have lost loved ones, have parents living with long COVID and have lost at least two years of their education. And if they were lucky, their mother might be, have a mobile phone but was trying to download homework for three or four kids in that household. So start and long-term trauma that we are living through. And as we emerge, um, you know, Brexit, the, <laughs> the war in Ukraine, we had the largest Ukrainian population for a long time in the UK, so we have very large numbers of Ukrainians around, but the cost of living spike um, and the environmental degradation. Uh, we're actually about to implement our clear zone, clean air zone, which is killing people um, prematurely. So look, Absolutely, the challenges, and I'm just going to talk very briefly about the four areas we're working. So, you know, strategic planning for place, leveraging the assets of place, education skills, employment, I, I would say sector development, um, connectivity, continuing the work on connectivity. But really crucially, that work we have to do every day about confidence, ambition, and positioning of place, because it makes very, a huge difference. Have I got time to say anything about what we're actually doing on those I things? So shall I stop? If we could uh, move on, shall I just that, that finish on some of the challenges? Okay. So, and, and much and actually important interventions that we're making and risks that we're taking, and obviously some progress. City of Culture is a huge step forward in the narrative of our city. Um, challenges and issues, escalating levels of poverty and demand, a hugely low tax base in a place that's ever more reliant on local taxation, so that actually what we raise is much less than if you were Westminster or in, uh, more affluent. Escalating cost of delivery of services. A stark thing for me, you talked about national living wage. When it goes up next year to 66% of the national average, 35% of my employees will, um, we will have to put onto the same level. Now that compresses six spinal column points in my organisational structure, which takes out supervisory levels, career progression levels, and is is, you know, will collapse the model, the organisational model, uh, that combined with, an understandably, uh, a pay demand that, you know, our wages stagnated, 40% reduction in resources. Um, combined with the dispropor sort of disproportionate transactional cost of competitive bidding and seeking approval from an, a very centralised state, those are all absolutely constraints on the kind of growth that I believe we could make in a different relationship between national, regional and local. And I'll, I'll leave it there. OK, thank you very much, Kirsten. I think people weren't sure if they should clap after Torsten, so it was a bit confusing. Yeah, sorry. No one made an effort, Jack. That's all I'm saying. No one made an effort. <laughs> uh, I'm going to hand over to Chris. Chris, the, because you're going third, you've been squeezed slightly. So if you keep it under seven-ish seven minutes, that will be I'll, nice. I'll, keep, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it short, Jack. Um, after all this gloom you've heard from these other two panellists, I'm just going to say, first of all, where, what is Britain's economy like in the global context? Well, we do always need to recognise Britain is a rich, strong, advanced economy in the world. I'm not going to say fifth biggest in the world, because that's a nonsense number. Um, I thought it was sixth, anyway. <laughs> is it nonsense? It measured measured right is ninth, but anyway. Um, 
It's hugely resilient. If you think what we've been through in the past decade, a global financial crisis happens once every 100 years, a pandemic happens once every 100 years, major war in Europe once every 80 years or so. These are very low probability, high impact events, and we are at the moment uh, not doing very well, but not doing that badly either. So I think we do need to recognize, uh, and I'm going to come back to this at the end, that we are a rich, strong, advanced economy. Lots of other rich, strong, advanced economies as well out there, but we shouldn't always do ourselves down um, at the start. I'm going to talk very briefly uh, about the short, medium-term and long-term challenges that the UK economy faces. Short means immediate, medium term means the things we are, are adjusting to at the moment, so think about the next sort of five, ten years, and long term means things that we always need to worry about. That's, that's the definition. So well, in the short term, we need to worry about inflation and the cost of living crisis. Those are the, that's the key thing that is on our minds right at the moment. It's not just about Russia and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. If you think about the 54% increase in gas and electricity prices impl implemented in April, that was reflecting prices that happened in wholesale markets before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It was things like China buying a huge amount of gas globally, and it's not all, don't blame Vladimir Putin for that, but you can blame him for what happens in the autumn, uh, and that's going to make things even more difficult. I think it's legitimate to say the Bank of England has in some sense lost a bit of control over inflation, and that is going to make things rather difficult for us in the next in the next few months and uh, weeks ahead, because it isn't just that inflation's at 9%. It's very broad. So when you hear ministers and Bank of England officials saying, it's just gas and electricity, we, nothing we can do about it, 80% of the goods and services in the inflation basket are rising by more than 3%, 80%. It's a very broad increase in prices at the moment. Uh, it's not just gas, electricity, and petrol. Uh, this, and that is, and we have in this country, in inflationary terms, a little bit of the US problem. Everyone's got high inflation at the moment. The US problem is that it is, they've got too much demand. They've pumped up their economy too much, uh, and that's going through, and they've got too much demand, too low unemployment. We've probably got a bit of that here. We've got, part of the reason our inflation is so broad is that we've got probably too much demand. Unemployment at 3.7 going to probably go down to a 50-year low on Tuesday this coming week, uh, going to go down further. That We probably can't sustain that at the moment, and the Bank of England is also almost certainly going to have to do more to tame it. So when people say, again, this is not the 1970s, or frankly, it is the 1970s, uh, we're in at the moment in terms of inflation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Because it's just, it's not oil, it's gas is the problem for us. We aren't nearly as dependent on oil as we were in the 1970s, but we are dependent on gas. So we also have a bit of the European problem that we are in a European gas market, even though we're not part of the EU. We can't divorce ourselves from that, so we do have that energy shock. So we do have an unemployment problem. The upside of uh, the huge increase in gas, uh, electricity and petrol prices that we have seen is that we are seeing quite a big movement in transport modes to bicycling, walking, and driving less. So just from an economics point of view, I'd say that does mean carbon taxes work. You raise the price of things, people shift away. So we do know that when we're thinking about net zero, that uh, works. That's a, a small silver lining. Uh, so medium-term adjustments, what are we going through at the moment? Well, we're still adjusting to the global financial crisis. That happened in 2008, 2009. That's a long time ago. But that was the big adjustment for the UK was that the world decided it didn't quite like, as much as it thought it liked, our banking and financial services products. Uh, and so the concentration of our economy into those sectors we found was too great and it also applies to all the ancillary uh, services that go along with that professional services. These are still extremely successful parts of the UK economy. They're just not growing as fast as they were. And that is a large explanation of why productivity overall isn't growing that fast. We are also adjusting to Brexit. There's no question about this from an economic uh, standpoint, that this means that uh, we are seeing, we are not at the moment seeing it, our exports are not rising in the same way that the rest of the world's exports are of similar sorts of countries. 
uh, and uh, we are not able to import people in the way we did. You, know, you can say this is a good thing, we, we prefer that, but we used to, whenever we got a bit too much demand in the economy, a bit too much spending, that sucked people in, particularly from Eastern Europe, and it was a safety valve for our economy. Well, we don't have that anymore because you've got visas. We do have a reasonably liberal migration regime, but, it's, but it isn't uh, a demand-driven one. So we don't have that anymore. That is an adjustment that everyone has to get used to. We're also adjusting to moving to net zero. If anyone tells you this is, not, if this is cost free, they're lying to you. Uh, net zero is going to be costly. If it was free, just do it anyway. The fact is that we need regulations to force us to do it. And so that is another adjustment that we're adjusting to. And we're adjusting to the pandemic as well. That is changing the structure of our economy again. All of these adjustments are difficult, and we know that we don't necessarily deal in this country or anywhere with adjustments very well. If you think back to shutting the mines back in the mid-1980s to 1990s, we're adjusting 25 years on. That has not been an easy process. We would never think that we'd want to be running an economy these days with lots of coal mining. Uh, so we, we wanted to make that adjustment. It was painful, though, and we didn't deal with, with it very well. We didn't deal with losers very well of, of, these, adjust, of, the, of these adjustments. So we, have big, we are undergoing big adjustments in our economy at the moment. I've just mentioned four, global financial crisis, Brexit, net zero, and COVID. We do need to adjust well, uh, better than we have in the past. The long-term issue, the key one, is growth and productivity. We need to focus more on that, and it's become less of a focus of politicians, I think, or all, all parties. Politicians are more interested generally in redistribution than in growth, and redistribution is a lot easier when the economy is growing faster than when it's not growing very much, so we don't, we've just seen the government basically ditch its planning reforms, which were a pro-growth strategy, uh, because it didn't, didn't sit well with many of its voters. Um, Leveling up is often just turns into parts of the country fighting each other, other parts of the country for money. And that's a redistributive thing that doesn't necessarily help the growth of the country, and I, I worry about that. And we've seen extremely low business investment since the Brexit uh, referendum in 2016. There's been no growth in business investment at all in this country, unlike other countries. I don't think the I don't think that's necessarily all to do with Brexit, but I think it is because things are not stable here. So companies do not necessarily see that there's a stable uh, economy that they are working in and with a clear strategy for growth where things aren't going to change the next minute. So there's a huge amount of uncertainty. For companies, so growth is the, is the key long-term issue we need to deal with. Demographics is, uh, Torsten's already talked about that, so I won't do that uh, go on much. We are aging. This will be more expensive. Interestingly, we're not aging in a, in a cost-wise as fast as we thought we would. This problem has got a little bit smaller, but actually for quite bad reasons. That's because people are dying earlier. They're having fewer kids who are quite expensive, and we've got, still got quite a lot of migration, but, uh, which a lot of people in this country don't like. Uh, but that has, that has brought down some of the costs of uh, the demographic change with we are undergoing, but I don't think a pro-death policy is necessarily what um, what anyone would think is good for our economy. Life expectancy has stalled. Has it stalled. has stalled, but that's because we're dying earlier. That's because we had more death than we than we expected, and it's not just COVID. Back to the perking us up bit. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry. <laughs> and and I just want to say the other long-term issue I think we need to think about is our position in the world. We are a medium-sized, open economy, and we need to recognise that. Stuff about saying slogans like global Britain, you know, we are, we are incredibly influential, we are, you know, it's silly. We should recognise where we are and uh, get real about what our challenges are. So, just to, to close, we are a rich, dynamic, successful, advanced economy. We should never forget that. That gives us huge opportunities to solve the problems I've just been talking about. So we just have to get real and accept these issues exist and think hard about what we want to do about them. And the key ones in this are we need to accept the challenges we face, face up to them, and that will mean both really prioritizing growth again, even when it means difficult decisions with trade-offs, 
And for this, this time in the future, we need to compensate losers properly because we need more, we need more rapid change, rapid growth, but without uh, the, the losses that we had, particularly in the 1980s. Thank you very much. There you go. You like that? Yeah. Okay, uh, before I open it up to the floor, I just want to ask one question myself, if you'll uh, allow me that. Um, and it kind of picks up a little bit on, on what Chris said at the end, so about prioritizing growth. Uh, Chris also made a point that he's, well, he, he seems to think there's uh, that, that growth and leveling up don't necessarily go hand in hand and maybe there's a bit of a conflict there. Whereas I think others would say um, leveling up allows us to untap all sorts of uh, potential within our economy um, that will ultimately result in a long-run growth strategy. So I just wanted to pick up on that and, and see, you know, am I right in thinking that you do think that this is a trade-off and that they're not kind of... Um, uh, there, 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 are, there are clearly levelling up opportunities or opportunities for growth outside London and the South East, which do not detract from growth in London and the South East. I'm not, so it's not only a trade-off, but the way we often talk about it in this country is about unfairness, about how dare London get uh, any infrastructure which is linked to rail, uh, because this, even though London actually pays for it, the business is, most of it is, is paid for it with the higher tax rates within the capital itself. And I worry that we're going more and more to start having a fight among different regions for pots of cash, mm. rather than thinking about what the best way to improve the growth rate before you've got government involved at all is around the country. And I, I actually agree with that. Um, and I think it is partly the way that government has approached it, which is around competitive bidding processes for pots of money, which um, turn out to be actually less than originally thought of. Do you see what I mean? Mm. And, and, uh, and I'll take responsibility for the fact that the North has sometimes exhibited that chippiness that you describe um, and, and can point to the disparities in investment and transport per head in the different places. And, and we have used that argument. Um, but I also think it points to Torsten's point about the lack of uh, a coherent economic strategy at the moment and the lack of attention that's been given in recent years for reasons we understand too, what it will take to secure growth in a, you know, and growth and productivity and a, and a distribution of that across the country that actually um, avoids failure demand and the cost of failure demand to the Treasury. And we don't seem to be getting properly into that space, which is the, you know, um, my economy, you know, takes more out of the national exchequer than it um, contributes. Yeah. That's not where we want to be. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I'm, it's not my personal, uh, I shouldn't be necessarily offering my personal opinion, but I, I sort of, as a chair, shouldn't be maybe, but, uh, but I, my personal view on this is that levelling up sounds like a great strategy, but um, it's actually a kind of vacuous buzzword as yet to that, uh, yeah. that doesn't have a clear, coherent strategy. I agree. Um, and I, actually, I feel like our political system, as it is, is very reactionary, and it's very hard. I can't really imagine how we're going to bring in kind of these really clear long-run strategies, and we're just kind of bouncing from one government to the next. And I think one problem with this is that levelling up just means really different things to different people. Um, I mean, and you know, some people think it's all about concentrating in Manchester. Some people think it's about... Or dealing with all the seaside towns and things like that. I mean, yeah. Torsten, do you have any do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I have lots of thoughts on this, but we should go to the question. Uh, 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 there's a few things. One, um, it often feels like politics is bouncing around until it doesn't. All right. If you look across like long swathes of British mm -hmm. politics or long swathes of other countries' politics, so I don't think I think we should be careful about. There's a danger of low expectations becoming <coughs> entrenched, if you, if one way, polite way of putting it, okay? So I wouldn't... Um, that's, it's not a truism, is all I'm saying. It's not like... Some people's argument is democracy is like that, okay? And when things get bad, that's when you need authoritarianism, basically. So if you're a bit careful about that, it's just what are, what are the particular politicians and the environment that we're living in at a time. I think the big question is... How bad do things have to get before something is done? Yeah, that's the it, like be, in long-term trends. That's what happens. Okay, countries have a period of decline or difficulty, and then the exam question is: Do they sort themselves out without needing an actual crisis? And some do, and some don't. Mm. Broadly, yeah. And we should obviously be aiming to do the do the uh, do the, the former. former. Mm. Yeah. On on leveling up, I think 
but we should be a bit careful about. I think it's reasonable that it's trying to achieve a number of objectives on the basis that we do want to, because one objective of levelling up is just to undo the very significant cuts of public funding that were disproportionately felt by poorer parts of the country, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, to local government funding, to schools funding, that, that is a large part, it is about, it is not about in the short term growth, it is just about everywhere in a rich economy should be a decent place to live, and if you strip back budgets, okay, we've, just, we've just been doing loads of focus groups, I was saying earlier in yeah. Hull, Barnsley, Scarborough, you know, one thing that comes across really clearly is people are actually much more realistic than politicians. People in Scarborough don't think they're going to have a kind of, you know, San Francisco-style tech bubble, right? They don't, they don't think that's going to be the kind of job people are doing, but they would like the council to be well enough funded that, you know, potholes are sorted out properly, okay? And so I think that is, that's reasonable, and that is a part of levelling up that isn't really about growth, although probably help it in the medium term. Mm. On Chris's point, though, the bit, that, the bit I would push on is the bit of growth that it can secure does require you, though, being honest about what the growth strategy is. And so if you read the Leveling Up White Paper, I don't recommend you do that. You've all got busy lives. It's really long. Um, but it has a reasonably plausible understanding of how growth does happen in an economy like this. It's not totally dissimilar to what I said to you at the beginning. It just goes on a lot longer. Um, but the policy doesn't bear any resemblance to that it is competitive oh, bidding as, yet. Mm -hmm. as yeah. yet, but it's not about like understanding where plausibly you could get high value added, high productivity jobs to appear outside the southeast of England. It doesn't engage with the fact that you know it's it's still playing slightly the towns versus cities row, which if you spend any of you here spending your time in Greater Manchester will see slowly crashing into their attempts to get devolution. Um, going. You know, here's one really important thing. Everyone says, oh, like, Greater Manchester, Manchester's doing really well, and that's like a problem, okay? It's total nonsense. What they mean is there's some construction work, right? Mm. Productivity levels in Manchester are very low. Wages, what's the poorest part of Greater Manchester? Mm. Manchester. Yeah. It's poorer than Oldham. Levels of deprivation. It's, no, it's the poorest yeah. part of Greater Manchester, right? The rich bits are like Trafford, Stockport, okay? It's the outskirts that are rich, right? So I think people need to just be realistic about the, what is actually going on. We have not got to escape velocity for Manchester. People, some people in Wakefield sometimes say to me, look at all the stuff going up in the centre of Leeds. Mm -hmm. Leeds is really poor, right? We've got to sort these problems out. Then, like, what's the fastest growing part of the South East? It isn't actually London. Milton Keynes, Swindon, North Hampshire. I'm not sure what's in North Hampshire, Hampshire, but something in North Hampshire is growing fast. Anyone knows? Like, these, and it's because they're near London. Right? They don't have some of the trade problems with London, high costs and others, mm -hmm. right? but they're enough within the ecosystem. So who would benefit from Leeds sorting some of its problems out if it was well-connected enough and we could put a train in properly? Bradford would massively. What would help Wigan? A properly booming Manchester that isn't just about being a big leisure venue, but it's got some offices that are full of workers. Right, right. great. Thank you. Uh, we've gone on a little bit too long, but uh, I'm now going to give you the opportunity to ask any questions. Um, and, and we've got a few. So because of that, um, if, if I could just say, you know, one of you answer and keep it concise, that would be great. And so we can get through a few of these. So the lady there was really quick with her hand. So um, actually. Thank you. Kirsten, you, um, and I'm going to quote here, enforced increased minimum wage collapses the business model. I think you said that. So my interest as a retired doctor has been uh, care in the community for older people, providing services. And this is a, one of the biggest challenges our country faces, and it's something that's going to affect everybody in this room, unless you're very fortunate and to have family and friends who will look after you. It's very hard as a, a care worker when you are on the minimum wage and your bosses, be they in local authority or chief executives of hospitals, get these massive salaries, having often been made redundant for spurious reasons from their previous jobs with a massive redundancy payoff. It's very, very hard for the morale, and something has got to be done about this, that they are paid a recognised wage with a recognised career structure, because they absolutely will not be able to keep their, ho their homes warm, they'll not be able to feed themselves, they'll not even be able to drive to see their clients if we don't do something very, very soon to help them. So can I just be really clear? I am in, uh, totally in favour of the national living wage. Right? I am totally in favour. What I was illustrating is that with that attention to the issue that Torsten described, which is the 40% reduction in funding to local government, that my organisation will fall over. 
were unable to deliver. So I am completely behind. Um, you know, we're committed to paying, we do pay the national living wage, um, and, uh, and we try to reflect that in the costs of care as well, and in market making support to productivity in the care sector, and the kind of, um, the decent fair work charter for people working in care. I completely agree with you. Um, as it happens, local government probably has the, the least banding between its um, most lowly paid and most senior paid. Um, you know, the, the differential is less than in health, higher education, business, any other comparable sector. So completely with you on that. I'm simply pointing to the fact that there has to be some attention. So quick illustration, in 2010, 66% of our funding came from central government and we raised the rest from our tax base. It's the reverse now and my tax base is lower. So for every 1%, I, um, I raise about 50% of what an affluent place would raise. And yet I have higher levels of demand because people are in poorer health and need more services in my area. So that, those are the conundrums I'm juggling with. And without some attention to that nationally, local government in places like Bradford is in serious in danger of not being able to do anything but statutory provision. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, so the gentleman here... Okay, first of all, thank you very much for three different perspectives on the UK economy. My question is actually quite broad, and that is looking forward over the next 20 to 30 years with all the challenges facing us, do you believe that the solutions um, will involve more government intervention by successful governments? Um, and I think the first speaker mentioned more state and, and seemed to relish the prospects in certain respects. Or will it involve a return to more free market principles, where entrepreneurs and big businesses alike can get on with the business of creating wealth for the economy, you know, subject to a, an overall safety net for the most vulnerable? I mean, I, I personally see this as a sort of dividing line. You know, will we go this way or will we go that way? And I'd be interested in your views on this. Okay. Uh, Chris, do you want to say anything on that? I, I, yes, I can tell you that. I, I think... I don't see it as a dividing line. I think the answer is, or well, potentially the answer, if I say what... Well, we are going to have more government in terms of more government spending because we have an, a demographic uh, challenge and that will require more, particularly health spending uh, and pension spending because we're going to have more old people and, and long-term and long, uh, long personal care. So, in, in that sense, we are going to have more government spending, but I don't think that necessarily means we don't, can't have a more free market economy. There are very free market economies, like uh, some of the Scandinavian countries, which have a higher proportion of government spending in them. So, and I think that is the, particularly the direction I think we should be going in, that we want to be as much as possible for business out, getting out of it, and I think at the moment we are... Um, maybe going too far down the telling business what to do and having too many strictures on business, but I think there is no way of getting around the, the demographic challenge that we face, which will require more government and higher taxes. Okay, thank you. There, there was one that was quick down here. Um, so the lady in the front here. And then I'll come to you. Thank you. Um, I came to hear about the future of the UK economy and um, I heard a lot of same old, same old. I heard that growth is more important than redistribution. I heard that GDP, I mean growth is about GDP, well that only measures what it can measure, it, it's not an indicator of well-being. Um, I think you're treating all of us as consumers not citizens, and talking about employment when so many jobs are total bullshit jobs. And I, you know, I acknowledge the question up there about carers. I, most of you are a lot younger than me and therefore are ignoring the elephant in the room, which I think is neoliberalism. This drive to roll back the state, to cut all our services, to sell off housing that they had no right to sell, all, all of that, the privatisation, all of that meant that the inequality increased, 
from, from the, the late 60s and certainly in the 1980s. Um, you, you have ignored not only neoliberalism, but a lot of academic work that's been done about economics. Um, and especially, I would say, Kate Ra Rayworth's work around the donut. Because the other thing that, for me, has been an elephant in the room most of the time is that the market economy is plundering the planet. It's destroying the climate, people's livelihoods in the global south particularly. I mean, I think the world is in a terrible mess, and I don't see any of the radical solutions that I feel are needed. Okay, I, I, I feel like people liked that comment. So, uh, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Thorsten... Uh, 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 it's good that we don't always go on everything in life. So let's take that in a number of bits because there's a lot of things going on okay, within that. So I started off talking about the 1980s and the rise in inequality and that is one of the big problems we are uh, left dealing with and that is partly, that rise was partly to do with uh, structural economic change which is what Chris is talking about, about large unemployment being concentrated in certain places but it was also to do with political choices about tax and benefit systems Okay, and about a disconnection between those for on the, the middle and those at the bottom of the distribution. So insofar as you're seeing those things as core components of neoliberalism, they're exactly what I'm talking about uh, at the beginning. Also on, on the extraction from the planet, the, you know, saving the planet is obviously should be top of the list of what anyone is trying to do, okay? Yeah, for the next 20 years. We're going to be, particularly on the left, the future of left politics right around the world in advanced economies is going to be basically social democracy plus green for like the rest of our lifetime. Okay, that's going to be the nature of what it is about. But there are some things I don't agree with what you just said, and I think you know it's always it's going to be transparent. But I think people sitting in lecture theatres, right? Okay, particularly all white people, but uh, and all middle income people should be really careful about calling all jobs bullshit jobs. You should be really careful about it, okay? Because that is not what most people think about their jobs. Okay, the tech books people read in middle classes say people think that. Go and talk to people. That is not what they say overwhelmingly. Job satisfaction in Britain has not fallen. People feel more attached to their employers than they did. It's all good rolling your eyes, okay? Yeah, but listen to people as well as what you think, all right? That's what they say right now. They also say on lower earners, say their job satisfaction has gone down, some of them, okay? And then you focus on the real problems that are driving that intensity of work, right? But the hard work of improving people's jobs is listening to them and getting to concrete issues that you can deal with. Why aren't people given notice of their shift patterns, all right? Why, why have they got a four-hour contract when they actually work 12 hours a, a week? These are the important things in people's lives. And if you walk around and say, the problem's neoliberalism, and I'm a big radical person, I've got all the answers, I'll tell you what will happen. 20 years of nothing changing. And it's attitudes like that that mean this country goes on week, year, decade after decade, not improving some of the big problems that exist in our lives. Because if you say the problem's neoliberalism, you don't build the train to Bradford. All right? It makes you feel better, you enjoy reading the book, and 20 years later, the country's poorer. Um, so, so things have clearly heated up a little bit, which is good. Um, unfortunately, right at the boiling point, we're going to have to end this session. So, um, and I'm sorry to not come to, to you, sir, but that went on slightly longer than I thought. Um, so, uh, I just want to say thank you very much to the panel. Thanks very much to the audience. Uh, it was great to have such an engaged group. And um, yeah, I think that's it from us. Thank you. Thank you.